there was some video that was supposed to happen that's now not going to happen, so we moved the set. Again. <laughs> um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Melody Joseph, and I am the founder and artistic producer of the Foundry Theatre. And I think there might be some people here tonight who were with us 15 years ago in this great hall with these great ghosts, actually, um, when we hosted another weekend-long festival called A Conversation on Hope that we did with the great Cornel West, who was in fact our first board member. So um, I'm really happy to be back here tonight in this room with these ghosts to continue the conversation, I guess, on hope, I might say. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to share with you, so I wrote them down. Um, when I started the Foundry in 94, I did so in hopes of building a conversation with as many people as possible about how we make the world together every day. And so I'm kind of obsessed with the nature of the invitation. How, do, how to invite as many people as possible to these conversations? What are the ways that conversation might be initiated? And so the Foundry makes theater um, that some call experimental or avant-garde, and some people say, is this theater? Which actually makes me feel like we're successful. <laughs> um, and together, I think these pieces reach for a new language of inquiry and attempt to start new kinds of conversations. And since our inception, we've also hosted dialogues small ones, large ones, town meetings. We had a town meeting on here on the subject of genocide and war crimes, from hope to genocide and war crimes. Um, I also stand up here, actually, because I'm so grateful that everyone who is here tonight is meant to be here tonight. And that we are here tonight, and that all of us are we all here tonight. And so if you just take a second, to look around the room at who we are. I think it would be kind of delicious. And look for somebody you haven't seen yet. And if you want to kiss somebody, you can. Um, please kiss somebody. Um, finally, on some level, all I really want to do right now is stand up here and sing out the names of all the people who have made this event possible. Um, they are smart and generous and glorious and loving and legion, which means I can't name them all. But there's two names I want to say, that I must say, that I'm proud to say. And one is Shireen Azab, who is our unsinkable associate producer at the Foundry, and she keeps us vertical. And she kept that, and she kept you all out tonight. <laughs> and had to deal with that. So thank you to Shireen. And then there's one other name. Um, and then I have the pleasure of calling out the other name, and that name is R.J. McConney. That's two C's, one N. <laughs> and without R.J., this event wouldn't have happened. So R.J., where are you? You need to come up here. How we do it because we literally wanted to make you watch how we set up the stage and bring everybody in. And so, you know, to kind of lift that curtain and give you a view into the labor process that is uh, an event like this. Um, and and uh, actually, I'm not here, this is my hologram. So, you know, and, and I'm going on tour. Uh, um, but seriously, Melanie already thanked everybody. I especially want to thank my coworker Shereen. And, um, and it takes a ton of people to do something like this, and there are a ton of people that did work to make tonight happen and to make uh, this whole weekend happen. And for uh, those of you that are able to be with us for Saturday and Sunday, uh, I think it's going to be a really rich exchange. We have a bunch of amazing practitioners who are, who are sitting with us here in the front couple rows. 
from South Africa, from Argentina, from Brazil, from throughout the U.S., from throughout the city. So let's give him a hand. You have pieces of paper in your programs. Um, hopefully you have pencils. Tonight, unlike tomorrow and Sunday, is going to be much more heavily based on listening to stories uh, from some elders and an elder of the future. And that's what I call memories of the future. And so, in order to try to kind of walk that line between um, being a passive audience and being an, an active participant in dialogue, um, what we're trying to do is actually, we're going to take a break halfway through, and we're going to come through the aisles and collect those slips of paper, and by that time, we hope that you've written a question that you would like to ask one of the presenters on that paper. So as you're listening, if that question, the burning question that you want to ask, pops into your head, write it down. If it's directed to a specific person, write their name on it. During our, during our break, we're going to collect these and uh, share them with Amy Goodman and try and bring your voices in as we're making as much time as possible for them to talk with each other and talk with us. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome our moderator and host for tonight. You may know her as the spearhead behind that amazing force of alternative journalism, Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman. marks the 75th anniversary of the bombing of the Spanish town of Guernica. I think our first speaker tonight, Grace Lee Boggs, was something like 21 years old when it happened. But this was a seminal moment. Uh, Pablo Picasso was so enraged at what had taken place as he spent three weeks in a painting frenzy and he painted outside of Paris the famous painting Guernica that showed the horrors of war, the angst and agony of war etched in the faces of the people and the animals. And that painting, Guernica, has become a worldwide symbol against war. He refused to allow that painting to return to Spain um, under the fascist general Franco. And so he had weavers make three tapestry reproductions of it. One of those tapestries is hung at the UN Security Council for decades. When the US invaded Iraq in 2003, in the lead up to the invasion, there that tapestry hung, and it wasn't lost on the UN and US officials when, oh, US officials like General Colin Powell and Secretary of State were making their pro-war announcements in front of this anti-war backdrop. And so they shrouded the Guernica in a blue curtain. What we will try to do tonight, what you will be doing all through the weekend, I think what activism, what journalism, is about at its best is pulling that curtain back to show the realities of war whether it's war abroad in places like iraq afghanistan pakistan and beyond or the war at home poverty inequality environmental racism and many other issues Tonight, we're going to hear three remarkable people tell their stories of what has motivated them in their lives and what their visions are for the future. I think that's what makes all of them great. Not only looking back, but continuing to look forward. 
and guide us all. Tonight, we begin with Grace Lee Box. Grace Box is a 95-year-old actor with 70 years of experience thinking and developing new strategies for transformative social change. This activist and philosopher has been a witness to tumultuous change. She's been involved with civil rights, black power, labor, environmental justice, and feminist movements. Most people know me first through this pamphlet. And Grace Lee Boggs' books were hugely influential. I'm not sure why I am who I am. I think it does have something to do with the fact that I was born female and born Chinese. Detroit gives a sense of epoch of civilization. Huge cultural leaps in a way that you don't get in a city like, like New York. As I have grown older, my perspective has grown longer. I think more in terms of centuries, whereas eight or nine years ago, I was only talking about decades. <laughs> Can we go back a little bit? How did you become a philosopher? I know it's a huge question. I know you studied philosophy. Well, I'll just go back um, 70 years. <laughs> Changed that I've done both. I think that's very important. 
I can remember vowing, swearing, pledging when I was young that I would not change because if I changed, I would be trained in revolution. And as I grew older, I've understood that I should change. And, and changing is really more honorable than not changing.
and the tobacco industry 300 years ago. We are redefining, we are reimagining everything. And that's an enormous challenge. Not only to change the way that we organize, but to change the way that we think in order to change the way that we organize. We are at the opposite of us and we go to the island of New York. And I have some concept of what it means to do protest organizing. But it's only since I started living in a city that was falling apart that I've had the privilege of creating a new kind of organizing that we call visionary organizing. And the opportunity is here for all of us to do that. All of us to transform. I've just written a column about Malcolm at the Oxford Union debating a few weeks before his death. And he said, quoting his challenge to take up what Goldwater has said in preparation for the 1964 convention. Extremism and the pursuit of justice is no crime, is, is no vice. And moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. So that's where we are. Let's change the way we think. Let's change the way we organize. Let's make a new world the opportunities here. Let's seize it.
but you could also wear a tight hat. <laughs> and that changed my life because I started going to the Washington Park on the South Side. And I would walk from Ralph Cole preaching to what to the to the black planet of the Middle And they when they couldn't touch me. And then what happened was A. Philip Randolph, the Labour leader, proposed the march on Washington. And thousands of the people in every city across the country were ready to join in the march. And those we all thanked Randolph to fall off. And even Mrs. Randolph thanked him to fall off. <laughs> and uh, Roosevelt was scared to death that 50,000 people would show up in Washington protesting racism when he was preparing for a war in And so finally, when Randolph would not give up the march, Roosevelt issued a virtual order aiming to banning uh, iron and discrimination in defense works. And that, that changed my thinking. I said, if a movement can do something like that, I'm going to become a movement like that. That was not the important one. When did you meet Jim? Oh, Jimmy. I'm actually in uh, uh, what we call the third day of school in the 1952 fall. But I didn't really read it until uh, we had this the school that where we taught, brought people from what we call the black sheets who were the activists from the grassroots to the school. And I asked to read the dance, and he said he didn't come around the room and get no more. <laughs> so, uh, a few months after that, I came to Detroit, and I did what I usually do when I go to a city. I want to come to the hotel, but it's not easy. <laughs> and I would drive him to and from me, and he would sit over the passenger. As close to the door as he could. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I invited him to dinner one night. He came, he didn't like what I prepared. I <laughs> don't know if that's a music I But in the course of the evening, he asked me to marry him.
and he got some of his son stuff in history, and my son in history came together. And we were able to organize on the basis of that. And talk about how your organizing in Detroit has changed, as Detroit has changed. Well, I think the most important thing to understand as an organizer is that human beings are very, very different. They're very, each one is different. We're not like a school of fish that is bombs going in one direction all at once. And every time there's a crisis, there's some people who respond as victims, and some people who seize the time to do something new, to exercise the power we have in them, to create the world anew. We all have that power. That's what I mean by growing our souls. I think this is a time of growing our souls. That growing our economy has been at the expense of the earth, has been at the expense of other people, has been at the expense of our own selves, our own souls, that we're all very damaged. And we have the opportunity to transform and become better human beings who are loved, who are whole in the state, and at the same time save the planet. And all the living things. You created quite a kerfuffle recently in talking about um, how we have to move from a protest politics to a visionary politics. What do you mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. We have fought for black power in Detroit for a long time, but we prevent very simple things, more blacks in office on the city hall. And then we, the young people, rebelled in 1967 because they saw themselves as becoming expendable, that the plants were all over hiding and giving jobs to young people. And as a result of that rebellion, we got the black mayor because the white people realized that the white mayor could no longer maintain the law and order. And then Coleman Young, who was a very smart man, found himself in office. No, not able to create jobs. And he decided what we need is a casino industry. That casino game would create 50,000 jobs. And that would reduce crime and violence in the city. And we decided to oppose him. And we said there is an alternative to casino gambling. We can enlist young people in rebuilding, redefining, and respiriting our city from the ground up. And by projecting that opportunity for people to do something to change the world, we didn't get a whole lot of young people, but we got enough to begin people thinking differently about the earth. The elders came up and began working with the young people, and that started community gardening and an urban agricultural movement. The young people have gone on to create a whole new concept of education as, as community-based to involve the energy of the young people in resolving current, current problems and not just to prepare to fit into the system. If you make a proposal that gives people an opportunity to exercise their own internal power, you're amazed what will happen. It may not always succeed, but there are many opportunities. We have lots of crises, lots of opportunities to tell people to become their troops, and lots of opportunities to give them a chance to do something themselves. You talked about A. Philip Randolph, one of the greatest community organizers of the 20th century, who organized the March on Washington in 1963. That story about Eleanor Roosevelt taking him to meet with FDR, uh, describing the condition of black people, working people in this country, and FDR sitting quietly through everything he said, 
and saying, I don't disagree with anything you've said. You'll just have to make me do it. And this is a story that President Obama told when he was still senator running for president. He was in the backyard of a New Jersey home speaking to about 100 people. And someone at the end of the evening raised their hand and said, what are you going to do better than the least? And he told that story about Ava Randall talking to FDR and responded to the person who asked, make me do it. Make me do it. Do you think movements, social movements, can accomplish that? And what is your sense of the Obama administration today? Well, I think the 1930s are very different from this period. I mean, we were um, at the threshold of the American country. The United States would dominate the world, and Europe would be in tatters. Today, the United States is a dying empire. It's going to take a lot more than maybe some, a lot of human beings. And thinking of that, that we can just repeat that question today, I think is a great mistake. We've got to create alternatives and not depend. I think that we voted for Obama for a number, number of reasons. Because I think it was time for us to have a black man in the, in the White House. But I think we also still have the illusion that we could do what most of us said we should do, that we could just have demonstrations, that we are a very busy time on the clock of the world. People. The United States could die in the empire. It's very clear. Do you think that America could rise to new greatness as a result of it being a dying yeah. empire? Do you think America could rise to a level of greatness as a dying empire? I mean, Gilman Galton, the father of peace studies, said uh, the fall of U.S. empire could mean the blossoming of the U.S. republic. So uh, we, we have to change ourselves. We have to recognize that we have to make a very different kind of revolution, that the revolutions have been made in other countries for more things. Uh, they have been blessed in the past, but are not well anymore. The planet, for one thing, all of the living things, we have to look for something from the revolution, and we ourselves can simply live. Finally, and this is the end of our conversation, but this portion of it before we go into a joint conversation and meet our other guests. Your thoughts on what has taken place in the last year, from the Arab Spring in the Middle East to Madison to the Occupy movement here, um, what you think it represents and where you think it might go? Well, I think it. As, as a great opportunity, I think, what the Occupy movement did in terms of breaking the silence and changing the conversation has been a very important thing. Were you surprised by it? Pardon? Were you surprised by it? I, well, I, I don't think so. I'm not going to say that I anticipated it. <laughs> but, <laughs> I think the work of freedom of action I think that people who rely too much on militancy, I think that if the Occupy movement does not begin reimagining and proposing alternatives, that they will end up descending the stone. It'll end up. What? It'll end up. What did you say? It'll end up. yourself. I mean, it, 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 that we, we intend to become more and more aggressive and more and more do you think the encampments were a kind of beginning of a reimagining? Well, we're trying to do a little bit. I think I think there are people who are beginning to think of that way, but not enough. I think all of us need to recall that when in the mid fifties Einstein said. Imagination is more important than education. 
we have, for, particularly for all of you in our imagination is more important than education. We give we imagine education, we give we imagine work, we give we imagine, we imagine demonstrations, we imagine everything. Grace Lee Box, thank you.
And the fist of people who are bringing the love of community in the public country. And among those we've been to with were Phillips and, and Jerson and Nelson and Greenfield. Most people have seen that iconic picture of the four students, black students sitting in the, the Woolworths on February 1st, 1960. Well, Greensboro is a city of universities and fields, cotton mills. And the KKK had a field day at the cotton mills. And in 1979, when Nelson's group organized a demonstration against them, they came in with guns, shot, and killed part of his associates and wounded Nelson. And what they started, Nelson went back to his country, very rich, to the country where he played, I don't mean the country, sort of like another country, but to the countryside where he was raised. And he went to seminary. And he tried to create a beloved community and to start the truth of reconciliation for the in the world. And they developed something to help the city face the race and class of the KKK, and also to help them transform. And they had a truth of reconciliation process in Greenford, which Desmond Tutu came from. And it was just, just incredible how, how the, the, the revolution of this thing in this period requires transforming ourselves and giving others an opportunity to transform. The American Revolution cannot be like other revolutions for more things. It's got to be nothing else. Before we talk about the beloved community centers of uh, Greensboro, the video we just saw, I bet especially young people, and maybe even older people, because we all live in very different worlds that are not necessarily connected. Uh, through geography and also through time. They've been completely shocked, never hearing about this story. Explain what it was you were doing in the 70s uh, that led to this moment where you pulled the permit for this march. What was that? Thanks. Just let me say it's an honor to share this space with Chris. <laughs> I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. I've been a bit of an organizer um, through high school. And in the 70s, um, well, in the late 60s, we had organized something called the Greensboro Association of Poor People, which was a network of neighborhood groups. And it really had more power than we realized. Uh, but gradually, we came to see that, and at the time, I would uh, say that the problem of black people is white people. was that simple and wrong to me. Um, and as we grew in our understanding and studied with Marxism, uh, we felt the need to build unity with our white brothers and sisters. And given our study of Marxism, the place to do that was the point of production, the factory. So we went into the textile mills and actually had done quite well. Uh, Jim Waller was the president of the union at Paul River between Greensboro and Durham. Um, Sandy Smith was the leading organizer at the plants in Cornport, North Carolina, about 30 miles from Greensboro. Uh, William Samson was the organizer and leader of the union building movement at the largest dinner producing plant in the world. Uh, and that was the work we were doing. Well, the Klan passed out flyers saying that this whole business of unions is nothing more than black people trying to get in charge of and dominate white people's lives. Um, and um, we had a conference. Um, well, first of all, we joined the ballet in a city nearby called Chinatown. And then we called a conference to bring together black and white workers, the black community, uh, to discuss how to engage racism in the community and in the factory. We didn't know this, but the Greensboro Police had given the great commitment that we had to the climate analysis. And 
and then they went to lunch uh, early. And these caravans drove in, caravans drove in, and what we saw on the film uh, was a massacre. They simply <coughs> killed the leading organizers and wounded 10 people. And the community you saw on the film strip is not the community that was there then. It was a public housing project. Little children were playing, people were planning a wedding inside when the bullets rang out and ricocheted off the wall. And um, five good friends were killed, uh, and ten were wounded. And you were marching for? And we were marching really for the unity between black and white and the struggle in the textile industry. And the people who opened fire were? They were a group that had recently named themselves the United Racist Front. Um, they um, was a merger of neo-Nazis and Klansmen uh, from across the state of North Carolina. And the police were where? Um, the police were, uh, the story they put out is that they went to early lunch. And uh, what we found out is that um, they knew the Klan and Nazis had come into town. We were not aware of that. Uh, they knew where they had breakfast. Uh, they videoed them, not video, took pictures of them, taking the guns from various cars and concentrated those guns in one car. Uh, and all the shooters were in the car behind the gun car. Um, and they followed the caravan for about five miles across town. Not they, but one surveillance car. Um, and um, there were no other police officers in the area. You were in? I was injured. It was not um, a life threatening injury. I was blocking a brother who was a um, person who was later identified as a Nazi who was trying to stab my midsection. So how did you end up that night in jail? Well, when this was uh, when I looked at the bodies uh, of my friend and a dear sister who had been the president of the student government had been in college, uh, one of two all black or primarily black colleges in the nation. She lived with us and her mother brought her. She was slumped with a bullet hole between her eyes as she was trying to get the children back. I was the person who secured the parade. So I sat across the desk from Captain Gibson and uh, had a discussion with him. And he said that it's our job to ensure the safety of this march. And I want you to sign a statement that there will be no arms on your side. So I asked him, why are you saying that? Because this normally how do you do parades? He said, if you want to prevent the sign of the statement. And when I saw what happened, um, I knew in the way that people know things without evidence and without maps and charts that this could not have happened without the active participation of the Greensboro police. So I stood up from Jim's bar and I started to say that. The police who were just arriving ordered me to shut up. And I said, I'm not going to shut up because um, uh, this mayor and uh, these police officers have planned the killing of my friend. At that point, I was wrestled to the ground. The person who became the police chief put his foot on my neck and I was arrested. And they would not give me a bond because um, they said that if I got out, that I would be a danger. Um, so that's how I spent that night. At the time, I didn't know all of them. So it was an agonizing night. Um, I was taken to the hospital, and I left the hospital and went to uh, jail. And late that night, um, an FBI agent and a police officer called me down to a little cell where they badgered me about the company. Um, it was a kind of, uh, they said that my life was not. 
that the only life I had would be to cooperate with them. Which to this day I don't quite know. Were a number of clients when you arrested that day? Uh, there were seven clients. Of all the nine cars, one car was stopped and they arrested, uh, I think, seven people. What happened to Graves after that? What was the response of the The community uh, was uh, traumatized, it was shocked. Uh, there were different developments around the city, stories that I heard. I wasn't out there that, that night. Uh, but the headlines of the, next, of the paper the next day said that the Worker Viewpoint Organization, which was the name of the group I was a part of, which later changed its name to the Communist Workers Party. Um, ambushed by the plan of Nazis. That's the last time the press said anything about the ambush. Um, the narrative started to change to that of a shootout between the extreme left and the extreme right, and that Greensboro was just a site uh, where people who were not related to that town came to have this fight. That became the, the major line. Let me just point out, <laughs> November 4, 1979, the embassy in Tehran uh, was seized by the students. And that's at least part of the reason that this story was pushed off the headline. The um, Shah of Iran, the Ayatollah, all of this was um, the national news. And it was convenient for this not to be the Grace mentioned the truth and reconciliation uh, commission. How did this play out over the years? I mean, now we're talking about more than 30 years later. Let me just say that that city became so polarized that um, I would not believe that a city in the United States could become as bitter and divided as that city was if I had not been. Uh, I've been in Court and people got up and went to the other side of the room. So the question that uh, I raise is, how do you convince a people that what they saw with their own eyes, they didn't see, and that something else happened? And that is largely the level of uh, distortion and fear that was operative for them. And it resulted in the Klan and Nazis being acquitted in a case brought by the state of North Carolina. And in a federal case on civil rights violations, uh, they argued that race was not the reason, even though they shot uh, two Jewish men, uh, a black woman, and a Latino brother, uh, an African American woman. Uh, and they were able to put forth the argument that race played no role, the Klan and Nazis, in what they did. Um, so let me just say, I, uh, we had a civil suit, and it's the only one in which any person of color was on the floor. Uh, the acquitting clothes were all white. And uh, all the blacks were purged. And uh, on that particular civil rights case, uh, the, the jury found police officers and Nazis, uh, along with Klan and Nazis, collectively liable for wrongful death for one person. Uh, and that brought that phase of that case to. So talk about developing the beloved community center of Greensboro. You asked the question, and I, I really didn't answer it, of how the truth process came. Uh, I got to the end of my capacity. You know, I thought I was an organizer. I thought I was a good organizer. And when I became isolated in my own city, uh, unable really to make things 
things happen. Uh, it forced me to rethink everything I was doing. And I uh, staggered in and out of churches. Um, and I was received there. I went to seminary. And while I was in seminary, the Klan and Nazis made a decision to march again in Greensboro in 1987. It would have been the first time that they would have been back. And when I came home, the SBI, the State Bureau of Investigation, would ask, uh, what are you going to do? What's your organization? I felt harassed. They would come to my home. And they were setting up the scenario again of the extreme right and extreme left. Uh, I talked with people in Richmond when I was in school, and uh, I made the decision that I was going to visit uh, the Klan leader and have a discussion. Uh, and I uh, called him. No, I didn't call him. I wrote a short note, and I drove to Mount Hollow, North Carolina, about 50 miles past Salisbury. I found near the foot of the mountain, and I found this trail, and the Grand Dragon lived there. And I went out there, and no one was there. So I slid the note under the door, and I called him that night and told him that I'd been to his house. I wanted to talk to him about not coming to Greensboro. And he just started cursing and uh, just went off. And I said, well, he said, you haven't been to my Jesus. I said, I've not been to your house. So you go look under the back door and you find the note. <laughs> he found it and came back. And actually, to make this short, after exchanges of customers and so forth, I said, listen, I'm very serious. I want to talk to you about not coming to Greensboro. And he shocked me and agreed. So I made the trip there um, by myself. He said, nobody but you. And uh, we met at a service station. We said, look for uh, a pickup truck with a Yankee hat on. And uh, I stopped about 15 miles out of town because I got scared. I prayed. And I went to meet this person. We went to a hotel room. And I thought he was going to go out in, in, in somewhere more rural. And we had this discussion. And actually, it was a hard discussion. But again, um, and I'll be glad to share it with people later, but uh, the end of it was, he said, and I, I just told him, this, this, this is, why are you doing this? And he said, we can break down women. He told the stories. I said, be serious. You, have you ever looked at the black race and seen how many colors we are? Where do you think it came from? Um, and, um, <laughs> and he finally agreed that, uh, uh, that he said, we, we are going to come to Greensboro, but the word I give you is that we're not going to stop. And uh, that, that ended that. And I left the seminary, and I felt that somehow we had to find a way, even with the most uh, evil not to become so bent in our own internality that we lose the little humanity that we have. And so um, I wrestled with this uh, out of my faith tradition. King was uh, kind of the person I looked to the most. And this notion of the love community, where uh, the dignity and worth of everyone, of all groups, bar none, is affirmed. And that we strive toward creating a society that builds the institutions and structures that are like the firm in themselves. Uh, and so I came back with that notion of uh, how to take the work that we had done in that city and to begin to fold it into this concept of the beloved And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was established. Well, um, that was 1990, um, and uh, when, when you, you pause on the ground, uh, I've used love connect, is that uh, all of this toxin is beneath the surface, and people don't know why they can't get along. 
and it loses its identity. It's like it gets in the ground and people start to drink of it. Uh, so how can you build unity in a city that's actually captured by this part of its past? So we uh, decided, we were trying to figure out what to do uh, and how to uh, create a process. And it really was suggested to me that maybe we need to look at South Africa and what they did, and Peru and what they did. Uh, and with those suggestions, we got together with some people, Lisa McIntyre, who's with the uh, um, entity here that oversees truth commissions around the world. And we started this uh, long process of building uh, a truth and community reconciliation process. The effects of Malcolm being assassinated in 65, Dr. King being assassinated in 68, the effect did that have on the community? Their different um, approaches and where you are today. I was in Europe when Malcolm was assassinated. And um, I was a follower of King, but I really didn't understand King. I was trying to be a good person. I loved to hear him talk. He could make that word sing. Um, Did you see him in Uh I was scheduled to actually meet him on the day of his death. Um, I had uh, been asked to. He was coming to Greensboro to give a speech. <coughs> Uh, he, was, uh, he actually was coming from Atlanta, but he sent a note saying that he had to go back to Memphis because things had gone on by from Memphis. But he was scheduled to be at Trinity in the church uh, in, uh, in Greensboro. And I had a nice following of students with me, and uh, we were going to cheer him to the airport. It was my chance to really ask him because I didn't, I, at this point, I had come to disagree with him, but love him and respect him. I respected him because I was thoroughly convinced that he believed that this would work. But I couldn't see how it was going to work. So this was my opportunity to talk to him, but uh, it didn't happen. Uh, so um, I was caught up in the anger and the rage of that period. And so I was, I was a part of uh, the people who were saying that there is no hope for us building anything. They killed our best person, our best prophet. Um, but that um, gradually gave way to a different understanding. Um, it wasn't a quick thing. It, it took some time. Um, and I want to borrow a racist term to kind of grow your soul. And all of us are born in a culture uh, that specializes in making people up. Uh, you know, now it's the Russians, now it's the Jews, now it's the blacks, now it's gays, now it's women. We have no sense of who we are except in some kind of otherized relationship. Uh, and so we have a false ID. Uh, and the ID that we struggle for is that we have enormous potential as human beings. And we have the potential to grow toward the possibility of affirming every single group, every single person, bar none. And we have the possibility of going the other way. The choice is, which one do you sow to? Which one do you nurture? Which one do you want to come into being? So all of this was part of what was driving our thinking around having a process that would bring the Nazis, Clan, police officers, the neighborhood that was traumatized, as well as those of us who were uh, present that day, uh, the children, our children, I had a seven and eight year old daughter, uh, two of them out there, we looked at all of this, and uh, we wanted a process that would bring some truth and some healing to what had happened. And so today, the work that you're doing in 2012, what do you focus? Well, 
we name our work building community. Uh, and, uh, and the occasion to build community can be anything. You know. It is how you do what you do. So we run a homeless hospitality house and we build a lot of community out of that. Uh, we build community gardens. As a matter of fact, homeless people do the garden. Um, we um, engage this unresolved problem of corruption and double standard in our police department. And we, um, we uh, in, uh, do energy efficiency on homes. But all of that is an occasion to build community. The most difficult thing out there recently is North Carolina has uh, up on the balance on the 8th of May what they call Amendment 1, which is to oppose uh, same-sex marriage. And, um, and I've been in meetings uh, for the last three weeks with African-American clergy struggling over this issue. Uh, and uh, I, uh, and I'm, it's, it's really the most difficult struggle that I've had with my peers. But I'm happy to say that we made some significant progress because uh, it's just so evil uh, to stigmatize and punish people uh, because of your fears. Uh, so we've had to go around in some, in some circles. And I say that because that's the last thing I did while I left the Minnesota Theater. And actually, I was pretty happy. more safe, such as mandatory arrest laws, 
relating to situations where now batterers now go to public police first, and uh, people who are being battered were the ones getting arrested. Uh, but even larger than that, it became a, a situation where the state is able to come in and say, you know, uh, if we will use, we'll put a violence against women provision on a very repressive anti-crime bill and now call it feminist legislation, and this does not get questioned by the anti-violence when I was in Chicago, when they were passing anti-immigration legislation, I asked, what are we going to do to organize against this? And they said, that's not a gender violence issue. Right? So this is how some issue-oriented we become, but also how much we have become in bed with the state. So we traced this as the problem is when 100% of our funding was coming through the state, the state was dictating solutions that we could come up with. But ironically, what happened was uh, the Ford Foundation, which we'll figure later in this story, uh, funded us to go to a trip to meet activists in India, which was very informative, but we met many of the non-funded movements who said, well, you think you're so great just because you're not taking money from the state. Well, why are you taking foundation funding? You know, so they were uh, giving us a hard time, and we thought we were so smug and self-satisfied, but they brought us down a notch or two. Uh, but then when we came back, we really found out how the revenue should not be funded because the Ford had promised $100,000, told us to go start committing all the funds, and after we committed all the funds and couldn't get back out of those obligations, they retracted the grants of our state with the support of Palestine. So we did send ourselves to the best organized big conference, the big multimedia tour, which is another story, and we had like uh, three weeks to find $60,000. So this is when we had to start the fast and furious house parties, phone banks, and we actually raised the money, right? So, so the lesson that we learned in other than foundations to be evil is also just the model of that had really de um, deformed the way we thought how we could do organizing and fundraising. We had believed we were actually dependent on that and had not thought of creative ways of how we could fund our own work. Right? So it actually had hampered our imaginations about how organizing could become such that we thought we need these glossy brochures funded by somebody rather than maybe you can pick off the pocket code and keep those or something else and be a little more creative about how to do So that's how the revolution will not be funded came about. As many people are struggling with these things, not just the anti-violence movement, we don't have a solution to it, but can we start a conversation about different ways we can do the organizing? Now I'll just briefly mention though, I think, what we realized with that process, though, is that the nonprofit is just the tip of a larger iceberg. Right? It's not just enough to say, we won't do nonprofits, because that's not necessarily the, the answer either. Um, but we've seen in many movements, it's not that they don't have nonprofits, it's that they just don't organize the movement through the nonprofit. Right? They have an independently funded base movement that may use a nonprofit to service a particular task, but the nonprofit answers to the movement, it's not the movement. So it may not be nonprofit versus no, no nonprofit, but what is the proper role of a nonprofit? But also, even if you don't operate with a nonprofit, if you don't change the capitalist way we live together, we end up in the same situation. Like if we're going to resource our work by we all have day jobs to share our resources, but some people have much better paying jobs, day jobs than others, right? Then we don't we end up just replicating a classroom in our organizing. So the critique of the nonprofit is actually a larger critique of kind of our individualistic capitalist model of organizing and living together that stops us from developing a really collective uh, uh, way of doing the work that can actually be inclusive of all people, uh, depend, whatever the resources they are. What is the point? Um, the Boarding School Healing Project is a, a, is a group that's actually now between the Boarding School Healing Coalition that's trying to build a movement uh, for uh, Native peoples and their descendants who have been subjected to the, uh, the U.S. Uh, boarding school policies. And just to make a long story short, if you're not familiar with this, um, basically in the 1800s, uh, the U.S. government decided that the best way to solve the Indian problem was not to just kill them because that was too expensive, that it would be more inexpensive if we uh, took Native children from their homes at the age of five, put them in boarding schools till they're 18, uh, routinely sexually, physically, and emotionally abuse them, and then return them to their communities, not even able to speak the same language often as people in their communities. So the result of this is this is where we see the 
beginning of sexual abuse, alcohol abuse, all these other things in Native communities that didn't exist before because prior to colonization, most Native communities were not patriarchal. Uh, they were not built on these structures of social hierarchy. I'm, not, I'm being slightly overgeneralized, but clearly what happened with the boarding schools that completely changed the way Native communities uh, work with each other, but also you have generations of people in these schools who were never parented, they were never loved, right? And then they passed that to future generations. How many went to the About 100,000. I mean, most people are affected by that, even if they were directly affected, they were affected by it, that in the community. Did you go? No, I, I didn't go to boarding school. And now, but I should say, there's still boarding schools going on now. They're not mandatory. But even so, in some areas, there's still ongoing allegations of abuse that are not being addressed at this moment. But the, lar okay, the larger issue, the important thing, though, this is a history that there's just been no acknowledgement of, right? I mean, in Canada, there's been a huge movement around it. There's been actually a settlement, which is very problematic in many ways, but at least it's acknowledged as happened. Whereas uh, in the U.S., there's just no acknowledgement of this history that has such a devastating impact on Native communities and just no mention that this has even happened. So this is uh, basically the movement that the group started with a, a woman who actually used to live in uh, New York, Sammy Tanita, uh, from the Rosebud Reservation, and she just saw what was going on in Canada and said we need to have a similar understanding of what was happening in the U.S. So she brought together people to kind of start this, uh, this movement. And it's been a very slow uh, process because we start to do kind of a documentation project of these abuses. And what, ha what happened is, um, for instance, we might have a meeting in a certain place in South Dakota, and people don't have a lot of resources, and it would take a lot of effort to drive maybe 200 miles to get to this meeting, and people would get to the meeting and they couldn't walk into the door because of that level of trauma. And the big thing I've learned from that experience is that we often have an idea of an organizing model based on being these cool, badass superstars, or any, rather than building movements around the sick, tired, busy, depressed, and dysfunctional people that we actually are. <laughs>
uh, a sister fire tour, which is instead of doing the usual boring conferences, let's start having kind of multimedia arts and cultural projects uh, that kind of spark your imagination in a different way and make you want to be part of those movements. So it kind of changed the way we thought we could do the work rather than kind of this boring, you know, talking heads, let's get the pamphlet out and educate everybody. Let's find new ways of doing the education that's something people would actually want to be part of. So that's how kind of my organizing chapter changed. <laughs>
future. Um, and Gracie Boggs and Nelson Johnson and Annie Smith will also just talk to each other, ask each other questions, share comments. And there are many, many questions that you have. One of them, how would you make the Occupy movement fun? <laughs> in this room.
He says that a three grade, and I think neuroscience is very, very important. He says that three grades, the matriarchal brain, the patriarchal brain, and the child's brain. And that the, so we have to reunite them and overcome the domination of all our institutions by the patriarchal brain. And I think that's a huge challenge to know ourselves and to know our institutions and to know what their culture is and to know that we have the power within our minds, within our brains, actually, to exercise a more matriarchal uh, culture and create one. Um, which 
has this remarkable, it's a home of book, but you see the beginning of media in this country, newspapers, who they were written for, always about who owns the presses. In the early days, it was about uh, giving out information uh, to white settlers in the United States about uh, where Native Americans were. Um, it's an incredibly comprehensive look at the lens through which we have seen ourselves from the founding of the United States uh, to today. Um, I wanted to ask Nelson Johnson this question about electoral politics, and everyone, um, electoral politics and especially in the age of uh, President Obama. Um, the movements that got him elected in 2008, um, and then what has happened, the goals of all these movements, whether it was the closing of Guantanamo at the end of torture, which clearly hasn't happened, to the ending of war, um, which has not happened, uh, to dealing with the economic downturn uh, and President Obama surrounding himself with very people who are horrible from the bankers, or as some say, the bankers. <laughs> She's my friend. That's my um, I want to make two points maybe more. The first thing I want to do is to join with Grace in saying that how we look at politics and electoral politics in this period is different from how we looked at it in the system period, the 60s for example, where the great struggle was to join something, to be let in, give us a slice of the pie, count us in. And uh, that was a necessary struggle. But now I think the issue is that the aggregate systems and institutions of the nation, and indeed of the world, are exhausted and dysfunctional. So the whole question of getting in is a different kind of question. So I want to say that first. And therefore, I think that electoral politics ought to be done um, as part of building a grassroots base, uh, because, um, and building a grassroots base that itself offers an, an alternative versus the view that if we elect Mr. Good Person, that they will make these things happen. They really can't make them happen. Now, there's plenty of room to criticize President Obama. Uh, in terms of surrounding himself with people that further isolated him uh, from the spirit uh, and, and, and just the grist and the gut of those in the body. Uh, he comes off as a, as a good-hearted man, but right now we need um, a vision that grows out of the base of the community that persists and persists and persists. Um, we're going to be in Charlotte, um, that's where the convention is this year. But part of what we're going to do there is first of all, uh, when I say we, I'm speaking now, I don't even know if I'm speaking of that, but there's a discussion in the Council of Elders about a role that we can play in preventing Charlotte from becoming, uh, how shall we say, uh, something that the right wing would want, and that's a big street fight. Uh, in a way that doesn't really help push forward any positive agenda. Uh, doing what we can to uh, register people, but I think that the key in doing electoral work now is building a base that will persist beyond whatever election we're dealing with and to continue to raise criticism and do the best you can to hold elected officials accountable. that we cannot think of the same condition of 
power. We cannot say the pledge allegiance to the U.S. Constitution, the copy of the Constitution which created in 1787, which is so long before globalization. And I think particularly Native Americans are raising the question that we got the land as to how we conceptualize uh, the nation. I think we have to think about reimagining democracy, reimagining the Constitution, reimagining government. And I hope people will come to Detroit in the summer of 212, from July 1st to the 15th, where we'll be reimagining the revolution and everything. In our state and another state, draconian laws are being imposed. Uh, the Racial Justice Act that we struggled to pass is being repealed. Uh, um, it really um, required the courts to look at the question of race as it related to citizen and particularly capital punishment where the numbers are going to show a tremendous imbalance toward uh, black people, people of color, uh, as these laws are apply. Um, and the voter ID and the same-sex amendment, uh, all of these things have consequences uh, in terms of creating a culture of division and a culture of hate and a culture of oppression. What's your suggestion on how we uh, look at that as we are seeking to build an alternative to that. Well, I think we have not yet decided what values we're going to live by. I think that this day, that's why Martin's speech of 1957 is so important that it calls for a values of values against materialism, you know, not only against racism, but against racism, but materialism. <laughs> And materialism. And I think that we have to understand that's where we are on the part of the world. Our towns are much greater than creating a base for the Well, I think that sometimes you make this division, like either you're for the revolution or you're going to do short term strategies that you need for basic needs. And we don't see how they can work together. And I think the reason is that when we do things like electoral work, we don't give up our investment in the United States continuing to exist, right? So consequently, we get disappointed when the president of a settler state, you know, founded on genocide and slavery doesn't work out like we hope, right? <laughs> Uprising that led to the appointment of a special prosecutor. 
very much led by Trayvon to Paris, who has been a remarkable model, but the hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps millions of people all over the country weighing in in all different ways. You see that making the uh, justice system work ever so slowly, and we'll see what happens. But what about that power of movements? And were you seeing that in North Carolina? No. I think, um, to go back to the Trayvon, I mean, that it's absurd to assume that an indictment would come down without massive uh, protests. And, but I think that in the process of doing that, people have to, uh, as our sister said, work on what's the long-term uh, goal that we're seeking. Because um, there are trade bonds in every city. Uh, there are trade bonds in jail all over the place. And they're going to continue to be until there is the dismantling of that apparatus and the replacing of that with something fundamentally different that's rooted in justice and love and so forth. I, so I think the point that was so clearly made here is that protest at one point was for the point of getting in and assuming that that actually was uh, the goal. Right now, the protest has to be uh, has to facilitate and help the building of an alternative toward the thing that's being protested. And providing for people a buffer, if you will, a space, if you will, uh, and relieving some of the oppression that grows out of a dysfunctional order of domination. I love you. Uh, what do you think of the statement that Trayvon Martin Legislation 
uh, in states around the country. The standard ground law is being passed in state after state. And what happens is uh, conservative legislators are invited to these meetings. They're often secret with corporate executives from a number of corporations, many of the multinational corporations. And the laws are written and then handed out as a blueprint to pass in state after state. But because of the standard ground laws and the backlash against it, and the voter ID laws and the backlash against it, and the work of groups like Color for Change, um, which is calling for boycotts of companies that have poured millions into Apple, these corporations, one by one, are pulling out because they are being called by name. Pepsi-Cola pulled out, Coca-Cola pulled out, um, the Gates Foundation pulled out, which was putting their money in too much for privatization of education, the, that whole uh, uh, agenda. Um, when these pulled out, the latest was Young's, which owns Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Um, and now, Alec has announced they're dropping their social agenda of pushing for stand your ground and the voter ID laws. I mean, these laws, actually, when you look at them, they are almost identical in each state that they're passed. The actual legislation down to the typos in the legislation. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really exposed. The Center for Media and Democracy in Wisconsin has been targeting and showing how this works. You put a website out of exposed. Color for Change um, uh, is a very important organization that has been organizing boycotts. And at least a dozen of the major corporations of this country, Wendy's and others, have now said they're not going to support it. It's been quite something. Well, I, 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 I welcome the boycott of all of you from the uh, weekly about but I think the analysis is still too limited. I think the, the, the fact that this country has lost two wars. So the fact that we are in the, our economy is in the shambles, our culture is in the shambles, all that means that we are very, we have to make a very total revolution. We're much closer to where the really was in the 1930s than we recognize. I mean, to understand the, the depth and the breadth of the counter revolution, and therefore the depth and the breadth of the revolution we have to make. Tavis Smiley and Cornell West just wrote this book, The Rich and the Rest of Us. They said that one, yeah, one in two, I'm going to give the breakfast to Andy, one in two Americans are now for new people, four years ago. Not one in three, not one in five, 150 million Americans. How do you address these kinds of problems? Well, I was going to speak on the previous thing that you said. <laughs> Thank you. 
lot of contradictions that we have to reinvent in that solution for. And that's where we are. It's a wrong, and Jim Crow is something we fought against. The name of that suggests that it's a racist question. It's much more than that. Our, our educational institutions are pipeline institutions. Our economy, the lack of jobs for young people, and for a lot of other people, has made people have to stabilize the whole country. You know, uh, wrestling with what you're saying, um, there's a sense in which, as the whole corporate state entity declines uh, and is uh, compelled to take more and more investment. The whole energy of making people other uh, intensifies. The historical basis for making people other, uh, one of the strongest ones in the United States, is race. So you would expect that to intensify, as it is intensifying. Uh, it doesn't negate the fact that the whole social order is collapsing, and every aspect of it has to be reimagined. Uh, so I, I think, uh, I don't want to see these things pitted in a way that perhaps they don't have to be pitted. I think Michelle Alexander documents uh, very thoroughly the case that she makes. Uh, and uh, the young man that we brought to Detroit, Jorge Cornell and all of those, they're in jail now without a bond. Uh, and when you see that happen, you can't say it's not happening, or that it's just an incidental thing. It's all over. Uh, that's the point that she made. What do we call that? What do we name that? And all I'm saying is that uh, acknowledging the reality of how race plays a role in the country is important. Otherwise, uh, people who identify that way don't feel that they'll be in this discussion. So that's the point that I'm making, but it in no way minimizes, I think, the point you are making. And that is that just fighting a race battle does not in and of itself create the alternative that we all know we need. And we have to build into our fight what that alternative looks like. and the creation of blackness as we get away from the property, but that also normalizes the property relationship to all people within the capitalist system, right? So to me, a struggle against anti-black racism is necessarily an anti-capitalist struggle. It necessarily involves that together. If we look at the struggle against uh, uh, settler colonialism, that's not just about being nice to Indians, Dave, right? That's about the normalization of the nation-state form of governance that's actually there to create uh, destroy an alternative form of living, not just for Native peoples, but for everybody's. If we look at kind of the war on terror, which as you noted, the U.S. should not be seen as being at war with the U.S. as war. It's about the normalization of war as a state of being. So the anti-racist struggle is a struggle against settler colonial logic of capitalism and war. But that's what a racial justice struggle is. It's not simply a kind of discrimination. Although I would agree that in addition to Michelle Alexander, we don't want to not uh, forget to read Ruthie Gilmore's excellent book. It's also something that's a larger political economy. I don't know why it's almost a place for Is it because you believe that we have to make a revolution against the counter revolution? I mean, is this discussion going to continue? <laughs> is that we have not recognized that each of the struggles that we carry on as Native Americans or as Blacks or whoever, at this particular time in the part of the world, when we have to make such total changes, needs to lead to revolution, to the American revolution, and not just to see how you name it, I think matters, what you call it matters a great deal. Uh, someone in the audience has said, do you 
paraphrase, what is community-based education? Community-based education is recognizing that the walls that have been created between the school and the community, uh, that they, 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 we prepare the children eventually to succeed in the system, is the backbone and that's responsible for much of the rate of improvements that we have. I, it, it is to engage the energies and the creativity of young people in the solving of the problems that are part of their lives that they see on their way to school. It is to change the relationship between the school and the community to involve the parents, the teachers, and the students in creating the community. Thank you. 
world to do. And that the time is right to create that world to do, to propose alternatives and not just to protest against what is.